bit back. Okay. Uh, so welcome to panel five, uh, Privation and Piracy, and I will be uh, moderating this panel. So just once again, um, I'll be doing the introductions paper by paper, and I will allow each presenter to some time to get set up, about 15 minutes for the presentation, and then I'll let you know if you're when you're going over. Uh, so we will start with someone who really needs no introduction. Uh, Jane Gaines is a professor of film at Columbia University, the award-winning author of Contested Culture, The Image, The Voice, and The Law, which is most closely related to this conference, Fire and Desire, Mixed Race Me Movies in the Silent Era, and most recently, Pink Slipped, What Happened to Women in the Silent Film Industries. She's also founder of Visible Evidence, the leading conference in documentary film, as well as the Women Film Pioneers Project, and just coming off from hosting Women in the Silent Screen last week in New York at Columbia. So with that, uh, I'll turn things over to Jane. Uh, again, her paper's called What Piracy Tells Us About Motion Picture Technology That We Didn't Want to Know. Uh, so in 1907, Motion Picture World posted an editorial titled Who is Pirating Films? In it, the claim is, quote, there seems just now to be a wave of dishonest and underhanded practice going on in the film business. And we want to warn our readers against being duped by dupe films. At least one later historian has argued that it was the very prevalence of the practice of buying prints of popular film titles to duplicate that led to that nickname duping. I've argued before that the 1897 to 1907 period was a heyday of copying and that all of the major US companies both duplicated film prints using negatives struck from positives and loosely copied each other's story ideas in the form of remakes. This was the great heyday of industrial espionage also. Lubin Company spy Arthur D. Hodling later recalled the reciprocity of piracy with a joke. He said, Two of the original firms used to dupe each other's product. After a while, it was such an open secret that each used to call on the other and say, now look here, that was a rotten print you gave me. I can't get a good dupe from that. The firms in question could have been any one of the major companies, Biograph, Vitagraph, or Edison. And yes, this image of the Edison main building, new in 1886, suggests that I'm implicating that company so aggressive in defending their own patents and copyrights. What went on inside this building, we now wonder. What was it like to do that duping undercover of, undercover, maybe not undercover, of darkness? Today, however, the practice hodling described as an open secret remains a too well-kept secret among motion picture historians. The disparaging attitude of the first historians, Ramsey, Hampton, and Lewis Jacobs, toward these widespread practices effectively buried them such that the prevalent of strategic duping and exhibition of duped prints has never been dealt with as the chapter it should be in the first decade of motion pictures. My attempt to count the verifiable number of titles that were duped and sold in this 10 year period has been frustrated by historical neglect, no doubt consequence of the negative attitude toward the practice of competitive film reproduction. Now here's a short list of both duped prints and multiple remakes short list, there's a longer list, and my favorite, The Pillow Fight, both duped in various versions and remade by the Edison and the Vita, um, my Mutoscope companies several times. Answer, yes, everyone duped. So my concern about the title of the Dormander Conference, Copyrights, uh, is false. I am concerned after someone obsessed with dupes and remakes for the first decade that we haven't critiqued the copyright law in its inception relative to first copyright in the photograph. And I'm listing the cases that one in this field has to read and reread because they go back and forth in a confusing way. And these cases underwrite my contention that we need to be critical of the idea of copyright as property. And to this end, I quote Lawrence Lessing, historian of copyright, but himself a copyright lawyer. But in ordinary language, to call a copyright a property right is a bit misleading. For the property of copyright is an odd kind of property. 
Indeed, the very idea of property and any idea of expression is very odd. Equally odd, the concept of copyright protection is no shield, not a fence either, around a physical property. As the right only entitles the owner to sue another who he claims has taken, stolen, or technically infringed. Uh, and the right is to legally defend, but that means being able to afford the lawyers to go to court. When one actually reads the decisions in these key cases, beginning in our case with Edison B, the Mutoscope Company, the patent infringement four cases really, that continued with Edison B. Lubin, which addressed but did not resolve the question of copyright in motion photography, one struck by the complete arbitrariness of the process, which includes whims of judges, not to mention the deference to Edison's enormous power. I also want to be sure I put on record that I believe that the US Supreme Court case, the 1911 Kalen versus Harper Brothers, has been entirely too hyped in our histories. Uh, did it resolve an issue of performance in the motion picture? Perhaps, but these questions uh, in their time, or how should we put it, um, bantered around and in their time, uh, open for contention. I think it's more important to take this occasion to think back and ask the question, since we're talking about the US Library of Congress where the deposit produced the archive that we now are so um, pleased to have funded by the US government. If we are asking about copyright, we have to say, was it William Kennedy Laurie Dixon who was so aware of copyright that he put his name on absolutely everything. Here we have the history of the kinetoscope, the kinetograph, kinetophonograph, and he's copyrighted his design. The photographs in that book, uh, we're well aware, have his initials WKL at the bottom. And here, right at the tip here, we have he scribbled onto a copy, which is in the Cinematheque Francaise, designed by William Kennedy Laurie Dixon, 1893. So here he is scribbling on photographs in copies that he's already published. He's putting his, he's scratching onto this 1889 first successful Edison example. And then he's raising the question for us of what is this? Early Edison camera tests date uncertain, or perhaps Edison Kinescopic Records, 1893. And I raise this because this bottom image is part of the wonderful Kennington Bioscope examples that were shown in New York in person and are available for us to preview online. Yet from the standpoint of any researcher who's read the correspondence around these court cases, as well as court transcripts and depositions, then in addition, followed the careers of a cast of historical characters, this struggle for copyright in moving pictures is not a story about the triumph of legal reasoning. Rather, it's one of battle over how to rationalize the guarantee of monopoly rights. That is, how to make it look legal. This monopoly, how should we say, stretch, has been dramatized for me as I began to test a new hypothesis that although in the US patent law and copyright law are separate specializations, in the case of motion pictures, there is significant overlap. And not only because of the original problem of the mechanisms that both made the apparatus work and in Edison v. Lubin, 1904, defined a new kind of photography. The easy explanation for this complexity is that the Edison company legal experts began as patent lawyers. More difficult is the demonstration as to how these lawyers duped, and I do mean duped, circuit court judges, the patent examiner, as well as the registrar of US copyright, which these lawyers did with carefully crafted phrases and strategic omissions. Now here I, I list Dyer and Dyer. They began in New York. They moved from Washington, opened his brothers an office, and then Frank moves to West Orange. He becomes Edison's general counsel in 1903 after Howard Hayes dies. We are all familiar with his beginning of the motion picture patents company becoming president of general film. And for us, uh, I also want to introduce that he with Thomas Comerford Martin wrote the 1910 Edison biography, 
re, uh, um, reprinted in 1929. And what's important about this particular book is that this shows the Dyer brothers as committed patent lawyers. First of all, patent lawyers. The uh, appendix includes 1,093 patents filed by 1910, including the early electronic boat recorder, the various phonograph, more than one phonograph, uh, variations on the phonograph uh, patents. Of course, the electric lamp, uh, he was especially proud of the quadruplex telegraph, and that gives a great deal of attention in this particular book. And the case that we're going to look at today, the August 31, 1897 kinetographic camera patent. But in addition to these 1,093 patents that are discussed in this book, there is reference to the 500 to 600 unsuccessful patents. So what I want to call your attention to are two cases in my brief 15 minutes. One case, uh, the fraudulent patent filing. I'm especially fond of this one uh, because in August 24, 1891, the patent office refused the patent in the kinetographic camera. This is a milestone. And if we just look at copyright, we won't get the entire picture of this struggle. Uh, later called fraudulent, certainly by the, the mutoscope lawyers, but we won't get the entire picture of the uh, sabotage and subterfuge and the ingenuity of these lawyers. And I want just to blow up one of the phrases in this 1891 patent written by not Frank, but his brother Richard Dyer, uh, another Richard Dyer before the one we all know so well, and call your attention to two phrases within this written 1891 um, patent that was for six years uh, between 1891 and 1897 con consistently uh, sent to the patent office. And in 1897, finally accepted, although the uh, historians of patent are completely mystified as to why it was finally accepted. And here's the problem with this. Okay, this paragraph, to quote from the 1891 patent filed, written by Richard Dyer, in carrying out my invention, this is writing on behalf of Edison, I employ an apparatus for effecting by photography a representation suitable for reproduction of a scene, including a moving object or objects comprising a means, such as a single camera, for intermittently projecting, and this is my other phrase I want you to think about, and such a rapid rate as to result in persistence of vision images of successive positions of the object or objects in motion as observed from a fixed and single point of view, a sensitized tape-like film, and secondly, a means for so moving the film as to cause the successive images to be received thereupon separately and in single line sequence. The movements of the tape film may be continuous or intermittent, but the latter is preferable and it is further preferable that the periods of rest of the film should be longer than periods of movement. Now that is long, but I think that it should pop out to anyone in our field. A means of and a means for is not a precise patentable description of a mechanism. It's way too broad. And the patent office saw this. Also in 1891, there was no such thing as projection and anyone who's taught the history of the technology we, we call the kinetoscope and the kinetograph knows that Edison was reluctant to take on projection and it was the vitoscope, not even his own invention that finally, uh, April 23, 1896 was the first American projection later than the French. So there was no projecting. What actually is happening here is this broad description, which is actually three long pages, is an attempt to capture uh, and claim way more than Edison had invented. Now, just two little footnotes here. So there are four different attempts Edison makes to take on the mutoscope camera. And two of the four judges are, how should we put it, strong in their language. One says he did not invent the lens nor the camera, uh, exploited an illusion. The other uh, in 1906 says, of Edison, he is not entitled to have his claims so construed. So he's got the description, three pages, 
not acceptable, four court cases. And finally, the last, not Ray and not Wallace, capitulate because of the power of Edison. And without really giving him the day, uh, let, let him take on the Warwick camera, but never the mutoscope camera. Lastly, what I want to call your attention to is the case of foreign titles and legal duping, duping because this is a colorful <laughs> moment in the career of Frank Dyer. So it's well known, Charles Musser has given us the background on quote, so quote, called quote, legal duping after 1904 and the Edison v. Lubin cases. It was possible, uh, according to Dyer, who was then general counsel in West Orange, it was possible to take any European titles. And if a print came from Europe, they would look at it, do a copyright checks that would be call up Washington, and pretty much they would go ahead, if it was a copyright in the Great Britain, they would go ahead and make prints. But here's, I'm gonna just pull up his internal memo here. Here's what he instructs the department, the laboratory manager department to do. First he says, okay, I'm returning these boxes of films I've, I've examined to you. And with this, he says, look at his, look at his careful wording nothing indicating that they have been copyrighted in this country warwick trading appear to have been copyrighted in britain therefore i see no reason why we should not duplicate these films with the understanding that and here's what's crucial you should say at the introductory part of each and about a foot of the pictures of course if it should later develop that any of these films have been copyrighted in this country we will have to stop making them I notice, however, on the Pathé films, the rooster trademark. Rooster trademark um, then should, of course, not be imitated as in not be duplicated. So basically what he's telling them to do is to cut off, clip off the ends and what those of you who have followed this uh, piracy development and the case of the dup duping king, the pi pirate king Lubin, Sigmund Lubin, would know it was Lubin's Philadelphia office that had uh, the lab clip off the ends with the trademarks before making dupes. Uh, it's, it's well known that in the book, Fred Belsover remembers and recollects that in the 1897 to 196 period, it was his job to cut off the ends of film prints before making negatives. So here we have Frank Dyer telling the Edison Company lab men uh, to do the very same thing. In conclusion, here's the explanation. Probably when we began to talk about, quote, legal duping as opposed to illegal duping, we should have gotten a broader picture. And I get this broader picture from the history of the establishment of the United States as a manufacturing nation. It established uh, after the revolution in 1776 in the first hundred years, it established in particular mills on the East Coast. And for these mills, mostly cotton and woolen mills, they needed equipment. And so to get equipment, they employed industrial spies who took from trips to the UK, in particular, mostly Britain, um, diagrams of those machines, returned them to the US and just duplicated the machines and the processes. So that began, a, how should we say, an entire tradition. And Lawrence Lessing helps us with this. When he says in free culture, the American Republic did not honor foreign copyrights. We were born in this sense, a pirate nation. Technically, our law did not ban the taking of foreign works. It explicitly limited itself to American works. Thus, American publishers who published foreign works without the permission of foreign authors were not violating any rule. And that's the tradition that we see in 1904 to 1907. Uh, so next we have uh, Hunter Koch um, and 
He is a PhD student in the Department of Cinema and Media Studies at the University of Chicago. And the paper is titled, Edison, the Plaintiff, Copyright, Patents, and the Technical Dimensions of Early Cinema Piracy. Cool, uh, sorry, I had to unmute. Okay. Uh, thanks, Martin. Uh, so uh, maybe my title should be uh, the technical dimension, uh, not the technical dimensions, but more of the cultural dimensions. Um, uh, as this paper has shifted, it's, it's gotten a little bit away from what I originally intended. But uh, in 1940, MGM released a pair of films chronicling the life of America's most esteemed inventor, Thomas Edison. The first was Young Tom Edison, starring Mickey Rooney as a precocious teenage Tom who has a preternatural sense for innovation. The latter and the source of my title's riffing is Edison the Man with Spencer Tracy, tracing his quest for electric power in the light bulb. The two, two films obviously cede much to the demands of narrative conventions and stylistic conventions with Rooney's Tom appearing not dissimilar to an 1860s Andy Hardy. But they do index a, a cultural image of Edison during the first half of the 20th century, and that's with us to this day. What's taken up as a narrative arc in Edison the Man and routinely adumbrated in Young Tom is a gifted but hardworking American toiling to bring about the electric light. Uh, the climax of the latter is Tom jerry-rigging mirrors and candles to illuminate his mother's surgery. In this representation, most of the industrial conditions are jettisoned. A man is allied to his most singular invention, indeed his most magical invention, one which shows America ushering in the electric age and establishing him as the wizard of Menlo Park. He was, or he, a man he was, or a man he created. For Edison, the man would be nothing without Edison the plaintiff and vice versa. My paper is not about the light bulb, but about Edison's response to motion picture piracy in roughly its first 10 years. I bring up these films, films where surprisingly only passing mention is made to Edison's work with motion pictures. In order to draw out the cultural space that Edison occupies throughout his own life and beyond it, as the Edison Manufacturing Company sought to define and control motion picture markets and clamp down on duping, it leveraged cultural knowledge about its founder and, it, and his inventive practices. This presentation approaches a material which may be familiar to some of you, um, familiar Edison Manufacturing Company litigation in order to reassess Edison's strategies for handling infringing business practices by his competition. Specifically, I'm closely reading deposition material from 1898's Edison v. Vitagraph and 1902's Edison v. Lubin, cases in order to highlight several concurrent legal tactics at work. These two cases are frequently taken as landmarks in the sedimentation of individual films as copyrightable material. Reading more carefully, however, leads us to see that Edison also desired patent litigation factor into these suits. I show how Edison and his lawyers litigated on both copyright and patent, how they articulated this imprecation, and how emphasis on patents informs Edison's methods, even in moments dealing solely with copyright. My argument will be that this is informed by a more culturally defined role of the strength of patents versus copyright and is furthermore shaped by Edison's attempts at self-fashioning within this landscape. Um, where I want to end up is a more robust reading of early cinema piracy that incorporates this cultural atmosphere, including the response to litigation by another early cinema pioneer, Sigmund Lubin. So here's arguably the first piracy case, Thomas Edison, Thomas Edison sues the production and distribution company Vitagraph for unauthorized duping of the film Transport Whitney Leaving Dock. In 1898, he serves an injunction against their further making or distributing any Edison films on grounds of copyright violation. We read, quote, the complainant was and is the author, inventor, designer, and proprietor of a certain photograph and negative thereof known as an entitled Transport Whitney Leaving Dock which said photograph and negative were duly copyrighted, et cetera, et cetera. A bit later, and the document, documentation I have on this is a little bit conflicting uh, to the specific date, Edison also serves Vitagraph with an injunction to stop producing any pictures on grounds of violation of his patent for the kinetographic camera. Uh, 
Vitagraph appears to avoid paying damages through some kind of agreement that's not doesn't show up within these documents, and it fizzles out between 1898 and 1900. His claim is based on letters patent 589168. In 1900, Edison goes after Vitagraph again for contempt of court, violating the previous injunction. Again, Vitagraph settles successfully for at least a year. They offer Edison his services, as well as a long list of films to hand over, including Melies, Lumiere, and Lubin films, which is basically an ind indicative of Vitagraph's uh, pirating, uh, duping processes. So on the left is Transport Whitney, the pirated Edison film, and on the right is Edison's patent 589168, as referenced in Edison's second injunction. Edison sues over both, essentially strong arming Vitagraph in an attempt to control production. In the process, Edison gains control over licensing, as well as leveraging another duping operation to his own ends. These documents intrigue me since when we read them closer, we see this interesting overlap between copyright and patent litigation, and this latent fixation Edison has on patent rights and full ownership of the device, in this case, the sprocket mechanism in the camera. Even in the first document, Edison going after Vitagraph for copyright infringement, he prefaces that he is the inventor and designer of this film. That's kind of a conceptual outline to what I think is a more compelling set of events. Edison, in 1902, sues Siegmund Lubin for unauthorized selling of his film, Christening and Launching of Kaiser Wilhelm's Yacht Meteor. This case lasts almost a year, ending with a victory for Edison uh, and a court precedent for the copyright protection of motion pictures as uh, photographs. It goes back and forth with, between them, as I'm sure many of you know. Uh, perhaps a little tangential to this, uh, but one thing I like in this case is uh, uh, that there's a qualitative emphasis on the, the film prints, as, as Jane brought up a little bit. We beg specially to advise the public that Lubin has been making inferior duplicate prints of this film, leading the public to believe that they were buying an original picture. Uh, zooming in on some of the particularities of this writing here, quote, we read, quote, that said photograph was taken by means of a camera invented by your orator, by means of which successive views of the film subject are taken. So Edison, while the case is about the copyright of film, nevertheless reminds us that the, its existence is only possible through the camera me mechanism he claims to have invented. During the case, Edison lawyers again wish to pick up the issue of patent. So Edison never uh, patented the details of your present projecting kinetoscope but they could sue on the basis of Kinetoscope patent 493426, which is different from the other patent, which was a patent on the camera. This here, they're trying to strike Lubin on the long endless tape, basically uh, a, a really broad suggestion of the use of film. As I'll mention a bit later, this is attempting to utilize a different patent than uh, 589168, which had just been declared too broad and unworkable in Edison's litigation with Biograph, this, the saga with them. It's unclear how far this went, but uh, in terms of internal memos, I don't think it reached the court. But like the Vitagraph case, Edison's strategy still seems to be to begin from a place of dual litigation, attack with copyright, sustain it with a stronger patent litigation. Uh, Given later developments with motion, the Motion Picture Patents Company, we know Edison's aspirations were generally monopolistic and indeed relied on his ownership and control of patent rights. My point here may then appear obvious to some, but I'm trying to pull at the threads of the piracy narrative and the link between copyrights and patent. Specifically, I'm interested in the simultaneity of copyright and patent litigation going on here, whether explicitly or implicitly. Copyright as a mechanism to control the market here uh, was perhaps not self-evidently or self-assuredly the correct avenue and might be seen as a mutual exchange between law and product in testing the forms of ownership. What within the larger environment of film exhibition was going to provide a market and what was going to be within the bounds of ownership. We see that in Lubin's scorched earth tactic uh, in, in the 1902 case where he suggests that every frame of, his, of films ought to be registered for copyright, thus making the idea of copywriting films entirely untenable. Uh, but there's also an implied hesitation, giving the latent understanding that patent litigation kind of functions as a backup. 
if the particularities of the copyright decision does not work in one's favor, there's still strong patent rights to enable market control. As Bizarina Khan notes in her book, The Democratization of Invention, particularly in the 19th century, inventors and authors, the split between patent and copyright, sat on different ground, and often the cultural strength cited in terms of invention. Patents were more a case of primacy of invention and innovation, whereas copyright was re rejected as an inherent and absolute right of creativity, where the benefits to a privileged few were circumscribed in order to protect the public domain and to promote the interests of the community. In this sense, the legal mechanism of patent law is stronger and is, and is the more conventional route toward monopoly. But its cultural dimensions also play into the public image of Edison as an inventor. Edison as a figure benefits more from the association with invention than he does be, from being seen as a proprietor of intellectual property. I'm interested in the shape of patent and copyright law as such within the legal discourses at the time, which would re require further research in a different presentation. But reading closer, we see even that beyond strict rhetoric, rhetoric about patents qua patents, Edison's strategy is also a cultural argument about his position as inventor, as originator, as someone atmospherically responsible for anything having to do with motion picture photography. Again, as Edison says parenthetically, said photograph was taken by means of a camera invented by your orator. This is Martin Saposi's argument in his detailing of the camera patent battles between Edison and Biograph. After the 1902 decision finding Edison's patent 589-168 far too sweeping, Edison wasn't charged on fraud and instructed his lawyer, Richard Dyer, to revise the patent and resubmit it to the patent office. Two years later, Edison again brings suit for infringement against Biograph. As Saposi writes, quote, in effect, Edison was demanding a retrial of the 1901 suit under a law dating from the same year, declaring that this was possible when no deceit or fraud had been intended by the nullified patent. It is doubtful that a man less powerful than Edison could have attained a rehearing. In the final, Biographs and Edison's monopoly on motion picture photography relying on the friction principle and the interlocking engagement, respectively, is considered by Saposi to be risable, since, quote, if two or more distinct inventions come in conflict with each other, in conflict because of the patent of one is so worded that it could apply to other legitimate inventions as well as to itself, the other invention is not on that account guilty of infringement. Specific aside, Edison leveraged both the patent system to monopolize his, the industry, as well as his cultural position within the area, i.e. Edison as a celebrity inventor. His successes could not have been enabled without this imaginary about himself, which is something maybe some of us know already. So in this final section, I want to spotlight that this is something Sigmund Lubin, the so-called pirate king, also knew. Here is Lubin's definition, deposition from the 1902 case. He calls himself, quote, an inventor and manufacturer of life motion picture machines, and as having, quote, invented and manufactured cameras for taking successive instantaneous photographs, which are arranged together upon a transparent tape called a film. This quote, if you recall, is kind of directly antagonistic on the same grounds as Edison as to who invented this. Lubin's claims here are obviously specious since many of us probably don't consider Lubin as the true originator of motion pictures, but there's two potential areas one could go with this. One is this troubling of what invention means, who deserves to be called an inventor, where do we locate that originality? The second, where I want to go, is that this is more than just hyperbolic language. Lubin began as and continued to be a lens grinder. In the Philadelphia papers, he was known as Professor Lubin. On the left, he's featured in a long article about invention, inventing new surgical tools through film. And on the right, we see his stature and the acclaim his cineograph invention garners. He's allying himself with scientific progress and directly tying his professor image to the mechanical apparatus rather than as uh, primarily, a producer, uh, primarily a producer or a proprietor of films. Uh, this is a large image about the Phil Philadelphia Inquirer hosting fight bulletins, where they give ample praise to Lubin for projecting his cineograph for the crowds, showing Corbett Fitzsimmons and Fitzsimmons Jeffrey's fights. We read here, quote, no, Edison, no audience ever before witnessed such an exhibition of moving pictures as that given by Lubin's cineograph. Only one man in the world could have given such an exhibition, and that man is Lubin, 
the king of moving picture machine makers and moving picture photographers. Lubin is a man of whom Philadelphia has right to be proud, for he has discounted at Edison and every other inventor in producing, producing life-life photographic productions. The saga with Edison continues into 1904, where here we see that Lubin, or Edison is going after Lubin for using his words, universal and exhibition, um, this emphasis on, on uh, the machine and the, when he's dealing with copyright. But uh, biographs and Edison's legal history is long and stretches through 1909. Uh, here, I just want to mention that uh, one interesting mo mo moment, Biograph publishes a full page ad declaring they've won against Edison uh, and that the sprocket mechanism to advance film does not solely belong to Edison. This would be in 1902. Lubin, uninvolved in this case, takes out an ad a week later in the Clipper that he's also won. Quote, we're legitimate manufacturers of films. Here we see Lubin's continual entanglement of films and machines. Since anyone can make films now that Edison's patents are overturned, his duping operations are legitimate. Um, and here's another ad highlighting the implication of patent and copyright, Lubin's uh, quote unquote patent films. Uh, so I just want to end with these two images I found, which are very interesting. These you know, they are in the similar poses. Um, if we're thinking entirely along legalistic frameworks and specifically copyright concerns, we may miss something more generative about American early cinema piracy and end up replicating a standard narrative about the phenomenon, namely something like Vitagraph to Lubin and to Biograph suit against Edison for French noblemen and then onto the patents company, treating this primarily as a textual concern, which is true and good, but I'm trying to think through how the phenomenon of piracy is always heavily enmeshed in other legal concerns like patents. And from this, a kind of paratextual or atmospheric grounding where all this plays out. In Lubin, not only in his actions, but also in his self-presentation, we start to get a sense of a, an expanded feel of piracy that's necessary for litigation and the solidification of market uh, di dimensions. Lubin simply for his output value. And I mean this lovingly, piracy for me is not a normative judgment because while Lubin's claims in the depositions in the newspapers and in the trade ads are often quite ludicrous, so are Edison's, not only from our vantage point, but also contemporaneous. Even he seems to have be, been totally convinced that he was the true originator. What Lubin seems to have understood so well is that law is malleable and exists not above culture, but entwined with it. Lubin pirated not just films, but the attitudes, the self-fashioning, the trade presence. Nevertheless, the brazenness of this was his own. He understood just like Edison that a successful businessman doesn't just play by the rules, he also makes them. Great, thank you so much. Uh, so next we have Janelle Blankenship, who's an associate professor of film studies at the University of Western Ontario. She has published on Magic Lantern culture, early German cinema and avant-garde silent cinema and is now completing a book on the German lanternist and film pioneer, Max Skalandowski. And her talk is titled, Imposters and Patent Wars, Max Glandowski's Creative Copy Culture Revisited. Thank you, that's, that's a mouthful, Skladinovsky, yeah. <laughs> okay. From 1872 to 1890, Berlin-based uh, Berlin -based Karl Skladinovsky and Sons traveled Europe with the Dissolving View Picture Show. From 1890 through uh, the early, two, early 2000s. Uh, Skladinovsky, Max and Emil Skladinovsky often appeared under the guise of French Belgian showmen, uh, Professor Moriot or the Hamilton brothers. Here we see the uh, Skladinovsky brothers double build uh, with their 1895 bioscope and living pictures program and also build in the second act as Professor Moriot. Professor Morio had also a lit rich history of exhibiting dissolving views also in Germany. Um, and they, in their uh, advertisements, also um, claimed to have patented uh, certain techniques, um, such as the uh, diaphragma world and nature mirror. Um, 
And this is actually something that other showmen in Hamburg uh, had used as early as the 1860s. Uh, it's a kind of uh, fancy term for a dissolving view. Uh, it wasn't actually patented. Um, and this is something you often find, um, the hyperbolic claims um, to use technology that is actually uh, in a sense, open access and freely available to all showmen and exhibitors. The Skladinovsky showmen also uh, participated in what I call a creative copy culture. Um, and at their, at their ex exhibitions, they sometimes even presented um, audience, the audience with a, a counterfeit um, a, a thousand dollar mark, uh, a thousand marks uh, with a, a special statement uh, to punish those who actually believe that this is true. And uh, Skladnovsky was also involved in a, in a very heated uh, patent war with uh, fellow film pioneer Otmar, Otmar Anschutz. And in 1896, Otmar Anschutz wrote to the Berlin Patent Office claiming that the worm gear mechanism in Skladnovsky's Max, Max Skladnovsky's bioscope patent, um, 88599, had infringed on his own patent for a twin projector and his projecting uh, Schnellsayer or electro tachyscope device. Skladnovsky already in December 1895, however, um, had claimed that Anschutz's stroboscopic effect uh, in, in this same um, patent had threatened his career as a lanternist and legally infringed on Skladnovsky's older showmanship practice as a dissolving view artist, copying the, act, the, the art of the dissolving view. And here you see on the left, um, uh, the projecting Schnellsayer, uh, and on the right, Skladnovsky's uh, sketch for a uh, lantern setup for a dissolving view projection. Uh, given four weeks to kind of respond to the patent office, um, uh, uh, presumably they were, were able to do so because they both had their patents approved. Um, and here you can see that Skladinovsky's uh, patent for the bioscope actually does also identify him as a dissolving view artist. So both patents also um, uh, had a limited time frame, and although these were big patents in Germany, there are a few different classes of patents. Germany had a unique system with what's called a large patent, and then a smaller patent or a registered utility in addition to trademarks. And um, these are larger patents, but they still had a limited uh, a, a limited time of, of of protection. And for Max Skladinovsky, that meant the two large patents that he received um, were only ten to fifteen years, only offered ten to fifteen years of protection. And by 1910 and 1915, both of these patents, one for the bioscope uh, and the worm your mechanism and the second um, for a color process, both were had expired 1910, 1915. So Skladnovsky also was really uh, interested in, um, in going back to dissolving view practice, going back to lantern culture. And after his brief um, foray with uh, film technology and debut, uh, the Bioscope debut, he went back to lantern, uh, lantern projection and repackaged some of his older slides uh, in a new, uh, a new fantastic program called Projection for All. And Sladnovsky also um, created uh, uh, a numerous um, other smaller handheld devices to bring film technology into the home. And the name of his company, Projection for All, uh, is quite telling. But he also copies uh, Otto An Otmar Anschutz's term, the Schnellsayer, for his own flipbooks. He patents, uh, he gets a small patent uh, for the uh, flipbooks and calls them Schnellsay books. So as part of that creative copy culture artistry, Skladnovsky embraces a non-linear and non-teleological copying. He recycles the past, but also dreams of future developments, creatively repackaging and remixing older media um, for a home audience. He's continuously transforming and reframing visual culture through new multi-layered media, uh, new color applications, live lectures, and live performance. Creative cop pop copy culture is again a way to put technology in, in, 
in the, in the hands of the user. So there's a portable emphasis on portable, accessible, and affordable uh, media. Um, there's also a sense in which media has to be contaminated, has to be confused or mixed. There's a cardboard war diorama that Sladanovsky produces for stereo glass slides during the uh, First World War. And this also, this small device also doubles as a camera obscura. There's also, as a result of this copy culture, a flurry uh, uh, of activity um, that translates into an at times uh, indecipherable, uh, unreadable archive. Uh, this is also a difficulty in trying to um, catalog, uh, as I've just done with some of his partial uh, collections, uh, catalog and, and actually recontextualize um, his uh, copy culture. So the small patents or registered utilities Skladinovsky received um, cover the gamut. So flip books, camera equipment, uh, camera caps, uh, uh, trademarks for cameras such as Rex, photograph yourself, a kind of early selfie uh, a trademark, um, stereographic um, cardboard devices, anaglyphic glasses or plastographs, color techniques, uh, and also three color projection techniques inspired by Adolf Mita's work. Uh, and then uh, another projection uh, device, another magic lantern with numerous slide stages uh, for different format, different format uh, lantern slides uh, patented in 1904. Uh, and, and, and this is the trademark for Skladnovsky's Fotografiere dich selbst, um, kind of an amateur uh, photography uh, line. Um, and this was a really uh, successful, um, six, six, very, very successful uh, business for, for Skladinovsky as part of his Berliner Kamerawerk uh, company. Uh, and, and this is also um, something that he needed a whole kind of team of patent lawyers um, to assist him with. And his primary patent lawyer was, was, was John Lehman. And John Lehman also, um, John Lehman also uh, assisted Skladnovsky uh, with the kind of funds for uh, the 1904-1905 projection apparatus um, that he also tested at the Photographic Society uh, in Berlin. Um, and at this Photographic Society, also um, other patent lawyers were uh, uh, spectating and um, also kind of um, observing Sladnovsky and ultimately would also become Sladnovsky's first biographers. I, I like to think of Sladnovsky's uh, magic lantern culture in the early 20th century and late 19th century as an innovative screen practice that could be seen as late magic. It celebrates both the shimmering art of the hand painted magical originals uh, and also celebrates the modern power of photo mechanics. On the one hand, the rear projected images are described uh, as original transformative views. On the other hand, these dissolving view images are said to mirror and copy reality, like sun painting, photography, or the 1895 loop films, which the brothers described as life-size copies of variety theater scenes or acts. Uh, what I didn't mention here with photograph yourself, is that uh, Sladnovsky's patent lawyer, Lehman, also um, was very, very busy uh, at the turn of the century, um, trying to uh, trying to pursue um, litigation against those who had infringed on on this trademark, um, and that in included many other optical companies and photographic dealers in Berlin, uh, such as Romain Talbot and Grass and Wolf. So the variety theater films, the 1895 films, uh, Max and Emil Sklodnowski debuted at the Wintergarten program in Berlin, um, were also described in advanced promotion um, as full, fully formed life-size copies uh, of, of the variety theater program one would typically see on the Wintergarten stage. This is the same language that's used uh, in full page ads and, uh, and exhibitor magazines like the Artiste. And the Sladnovskys build their seventh variety, variety film on this program 
as Ringkampf or Ringkampf's Fischen Kreiner und Sandau. Okay, and I started to kind of look more closely at this particular film, this loop film number seven on the program. Um, it's one of the only loop films that in 1895 uh, does mention the name of the of the artists of the performers, um, even the Skladanovsky brothers who are billed as, as uh, uh, loop film number eight were not always mentioned. Um, Gabruta Skladanovsky, their name was left out in some of the original advertisements. So Ringkampf's Fischen Kleiner and Sando or the 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 wrestling match um, is is an interesting is an interesting film for many reasons. Um, and again, the 1895, most of the advertisements didn't mention specific performers, just the patented projector itself. Um, but uh, film historians often uh, use Sando to again point to, you know, uh, the importance of having uh, a commercial film first. Sando is seen as being remarkable in early film history for having been not only a star of the world's first commercial film presentation, but also the star of the first commercial presentation of projected film in Europe and the public debut of the prestigious uh, Biograph projector in Pittsburgh in September 1896. Um, and uh, that's Luke Mc McKernan's article, Sport and the First Films. Um, and other uh, film historians um, such as Charles Muser, uh, Dan Striebel and Deke Russell uh, also refer uh, to Sando and Sladnowski's program, um, not questioning the identity um, of this performer and assuming this is the strong man Eugen Sando. Sando. Um, also in, um, in The Devil Knows and Senses of Cinema, um, Stephen Berber, Barber also writes, Max and Emil Skladnowski undertook the first projection event of celluloid films for a public paying audience. A further film depicted a celebrated bodybuilder and wrestler of the era, Eugen Sando fighting another wrestler named Greiner. But uh, Stephen Barber, uh, two years later, starts to question um, uh, this narrative um, and kind of goes back to the actual uh, film and the bodies and says here, um, within their program of films shown at the Winter Garden Ballroom, the Skladnowski brothers included a film entitled Wrestlers, Griner and Sando, in, in intimating that one of the two combatants shown was the then celebrated German bodybuilder and wrestler Eugen Sando who had already been filmed in the USA on 6 March, 1894. Barber con continues, the far, far less muscular body of the counterfeit Sando seen performing a wrestling bout in the Skladnowski brothers' own film is entirely mismatched from the real Sando who had been filmed in the USA. Uh, through that seminal figure of the bogus, fraudulently invoked Sando in the Skladnowski brothers' film, a formative duplicity and corporeal disjunction are set to work. So I started to ask also uh, myself when looking at the film uh, and, and seeing the different kinds of um, bodies performing, uh, uh, what, who are these performers? Uh, and and uh, is, it, is there any chance it could be Eugen Sando uh, against Greiner or, uh, or is, it, is, it, is it someone else entirely? Um, and here are just two posters for the Siegfeld uh, head, highline, headline event, Sando Trocador Vaudevilles. Um, and, and obviously Sando um, as a strong man was a top build vaudeville act. And you know, Edison's kinetoscope um, also presented Sando as the modern Hercules. Uh, and again, uh, Dixon in his, um, in his kind of proprietary zeal has to uh, again, uh, present a kind of souvenir strip of Eugen Sando uh, as he steps in front of kinet the kinetoscope camera. Um, and here you have Eugen Sando um, kind of, uh, uh, and the, the ringer. Uh, here we have Skladnowski's wrestlers um, and we can compare their body types and you can kind of see that it's clear that uh, Sando's performers do not have the same kind of build. <laughs> so this is um, also uh, a print used. It was a paper print for, actually it was a flip book um, contact. And um, here we can see actually the, the short loop film 
alongside a rare photo of Sando in a wrestling pose from his time in Italy. Uh, and it is true that while, um, while Max Gladinovsky was working on the Winter Garden program and perfecting the bioscope, uh, Hercules M. Tricot, or Sando, was shown on the kinetoscope in uh, Berlin um, at, at the Friedrichstrasse venue, Friedrichstrasse 65. It was previously thought that the kinetoscope debuted at Castan's Panopticum, but actually wasn't the case. It, was, it, it debuted at a shopping center. Um, more like a passage or arcade. Um, and the kinetoscope was extremely popular, uh, had a four month, um, four month, uh, four month run, uh, and then moved on to um, several other venues in Berlin, including an Italian in Berlin um, exhibition um, on the river. Okay, and uh, so, so Slavonovsky knew about, had probably seen um, uh, the modern Hercules, um, but Sando wasn't really available. And Sando, uh, Siegfeld also made it clear to Europeans that he was under contract in summer 1895. So this again makes it unlikely that Eugen Sando would have, uh, 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 would have been available for a Wintergarten uh, um, filmed attraction um, at that time. And the real important clue uh, is, of course, always in the archive. And one, one summer, I found uh, a letter Max Sandor had written to Max and Emil Skladnovsky after um, the 40-year the, the anniversary of the Wintergarten in Berlin. Uh, and this is, uh, these are, this is Max and Fred Sandor, um, aristocratic acrobats and Napoleons of all gymnasts, um, the wonder of two hemispheres. Uh, and these acrobats and equilibrists um, uh, were also uh, um, the performers for, uh, for Sladinovsky's Wintergarden program. So this is uh, their letterhead and they write a letter to, um, it's, it's Max who writes a letter to Max and Emil Sladinovsky. Dear colleagues, a few days ago, I was in the Wintergarden and saw the wrestling match we did circa 40 years ago in front of your camera in the Friedrich Wilhelmstedtchen Park it was a dear memory. This is why I am writing this letter. I would have loved to speak to you after the show, but I had other social obligations. All my best wishes for the future. So Sandor, um, the Sandor brothers uh, on their letterhead uh, claim that they will be the talk of the show, seeing as believing, no fake tricks. This is not a circus act. It's specially arranged for vaudeville, the most sensational act ever seen in the world. And our stunts are not copyrighted. So these are copycats who resist copyright. And then certainly it's no surprise that as Sando imitators, and Sando was known to be really litigious, uh, that they weren't eager to evoke copyright. Um, copyright uh, copyrighted stunts could also complicate contracts with booking agents, uh, but also in walking the tightrope between singular specificity and duplicity. Um, what they also imply is that original and singular erratic performances can't be fully copied. Uh, while they are emulating Sando's physical culture mobility and also embrace the moving picture machine, uh, the athletes are seem shy and they seem to shy away from the demystifying and restrictive policy of policing their bodies. Um, copyright in a sense uh, seems to be synonymous with straight jacket reproducibility. So their novelty act, um, again, in, in also in North America on their North American tour from 1910 to 1915, um, is, is, is uh, one that, that covers physical culture, body exhibition, living pictures, and um, human Ferris wheel acts, trapeze, and aerial work. They appear as headliner acts at some of the top venues and varieties, but also at circuses. Yeah, and you see that sometimes they are also billed as the Sando brothers. We have about one minute left. Okay. Okay. If they also appear at Coaster and Bales Music Hall in New York City on 23rd Street um, and another 
um, a variety performer writes, on came the acrobats in white capes, handlebar mustaches, gold tooth grim smiles. They bowed gravely, removed capes and solemnly flexed muscles. Uh, to Hattie, it was boring, uh, but Sim enjoyed it. The influence of Sando, the strong man was still powerful. And this act even used the name Sandor Brothers. So they're Sandor um, imitators, if not imp Im imposters. I um, mean, there's a whole um, a kind of uh, uh, list here of different Sando imposters and imitators. Um, but what's interesting too is that uh, Sando actually, in the newspaper, according to newspapers, considered also suing Edison. Um, there's an article I found uh, that that states it was rumored that Sando uh, threatened to sue Edison. Uh, and the kinetoscope company for heavy damages, claiming that the exhibition of his performances on the kinetoscope, um, which was unauthorized, uh, will materially reduce his business. And, and Sando also uh, patented his own um, moving picture device in 1898. Okay, um, and I'm going to move really quickly. I know I have, I have about one minute left um, through some other examples of Skladinovsky copy culture. Um, this is a, a photochrome print he purchased from Photochrome Zurich, and he used this uh, for his projection for all slide uh, series. And it's, a, it's now transformed into a black and white image, but these images could be colorized. So the slides could be colorized for a fee. And this is an example of a black and white photograph he purchases from another uh, um, photographic uh, dealer. And then it's hand colorized um, by Lucy Skladinovsky, his daughter. So there's a sense in which colorizing can also be some kind of playful repurposing of pirated images, images that Skladinovsky has, has taken um, uh, from other uh, manufacturers and dealers, although Skladinovsky himself also takes photographs. Okay, so Skladinovsky in a few cases um, also took the photographs, copied or pirated the photographs of Ultimar Anschutz, uh, fellow uh, film pioneer. And here you can see his hand colorized versions of, of Ultimar Anschutz 1894 photographs of Lilienthal's um, flight. So there's a creative cycle of copying and reuse. Um, and Lilienthal, Anschutz, and Skladnovsky are, um, are all um, dreaming of, uh, of, 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 of a technological future of the flying human. And uh, also, I just want to end on um, another note uh, in, 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 in keeping with the theme of patents and copyright. Um, there were several. Um, there was, there was a very interesting case when Skladinovsky stereoscopic um, anagraphic albums were pirated in the United States. Um, and you have the United States as pirate nation um, and several newspapers would reproduce, uh, sorry, would, would actually give away Skladinovsky's um, uh, stereograph pages um, as Sunday supplements, the plastograph included. Sorry, my images are not loading. <laughs> yeah. You can imagine well, that there's an image of a stereograph here. I, I, I okay. want to make sure we have a little time for questions so we can. OK, um... I'm just going to go to my last. Uh, but these <laughs> these um, these copyrighted um, this the, the, the stereograph um, pages were also finally copyrighted by um, by the publisher Deutscher Verlag. Um, so uh, they, they put an end to, uh, to all the pirating and the Sunday supplements, and they started to um, protect Skadnowski's images. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, so uh, we now have Tammy Williams, who's an Associate Professor of Film Studies in English at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and of course, is the president of Domator. Uh, she's the author of Jermaine Durlach, A Cinema of Sensations, co-editor of a number of uh, edited volumes, Provenance and Early Cinema, the Domator volume from 2020, Jermaine Dulac, What is Cinema, 2019, Global Cinema Networks, 2018, Performing New Media, 1895 to 1915, which was from 2014, and also edited a special issue of The Moving Image on Early Cinema in the Archive. Uh, so Tammy, I'll turn things over to you. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Martin, and thank you all for these wonderful talks. Um, we've had a great morning. And uh, so I'm going to try to share my screen. I think um, maybe Janelle, you have to unshare. 
do I? I can't I cannot share yet unless uh, Janelle unshares. Oh yeah. Okay, let me try that again. Um, okay, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, oops, <laughs> sorry. So um, my uh, presentation is, uh, I retitled it slightly. It's called uh, Copyrights, uh, sorry, Choreographies, Copying and Rights, and Migrating Gestures in Modern Dance and Early French Cinema. Um, so, one of, so I was challenged to, uh, think about copyright in relation to um, my project, which really is um, looking at, uh, it, it explores intermedial mobility, mobile gestures, um, and also uh, something that copyright has helped me to think about is the question of feminist empire or the, the complex relations between uh, imperialism and feminism during the Belle Epoque or late 19th, early 20th century uh, France. Um, sorry, oh, I've got to turn off this um, here. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, so, uh, so Belle Epoque Paris was a vital cosmopolitan hub for a widespread restructuring of suggestive art forms, including new pictorial models, innovative musical compositions, and widespread theatrical renovation that would, uh, that would galvanize, I'll leave it there, um, that would galvanize the art world, sorry. Um, that, and intermedial cinematic expressivity, um, and open up new discursive spaces for the expressivity, uh, for the expression of gender and sexuality. And that's something that I've been looking at uh, in terms of the symbolist influence during the Belle Epoque period. Uh, thanks to Domator, I've, I've been focusing more on this early period in which uh, the filmmaker that I work on, Germaine Dulac, uh, was a, both a journalist, a feminist journalist at La Française and a theater critic during the period of 1906 to 1914 before entering the cinema, uh, the film industry during the war. Uh, so also I've been looking at her um, early writings and certain things have come back to me and this uh, that I've really wanted to focus on. And one is the question of gesture. And so this is an, an excerpt from one of her early articles, 1917, that is, has not been published uh, beyond its initial publication, um, where she says, isn't there a lot to be said when one can exploit the most subtle nuances of light, make gestures speak uh, and evoke all through our eyes that addresses our spirit from reality to dream. So I really kind of focused in on this first article that she writes on mise-en-scene when she's really calling for uh, aesthetic realism, but she's also, uh, so a cinema uh, without uh, indoor decors, um, also the use of non-professional actors and already alluding to the simplification of uh, or condensation of narrative. So, uh, so I began looking at uh, modern dance and, and uh, uh, sorry, let me say a little bit more about this question of feminist empire that I've kind of come to, to look at. Um, so in this paper, I'm, I'm trying to explore the, uh, um, this space, these discursive spaces that I think are opened up by some of the same questions that we find in the copyright case of Lowy. Fuller. Um, and again, so um, a kind of universalism, this kind of, uh, sorry, um, uh, um, how, how uh, feminist engagement with empire um, or this kind of, uh, the, their relationship to ultimately the, the forms of, of imperialism and uh, gender liberation, the connections between these, these two, and the relationship of, of feminists who are drawing upon um, uh, notions of uh, empire in 
their in their creative works, in their writings, in dance, and in film, uh, but also questions of universalism and nature that are tied to, to dance uh, that uh, present colonized people with theoretical yet impossible paths to integration. Um, so similar to the barriers that women um, and uh, queer uh, queer persons like Loie Fuller and Jermaine Dulac are facing. So there's this kind of push-pull in both of these. Um, okay, so uh, amongst key symbolist models, it was through the exhilarating forms of transatlantic modern dancers, uh, American dancers, such as Isadora Duncan and, uh, and Loie Fuller, that, uh, that's Isadora Duncan and Loie uh, Fuller and pan-European uh, dancers uh, such as Dnieper Koska and Ida Rubinstein and Pan-Asian uh, dancers such as Indonesian dancer Jamil An Anik, um, that the female body was liberated from classical ballet to adopt an unrestrained lyricism. This, um, as Anne Higone has argued, this lyricism allowed women to take control of their visual identity and to free it from the limits within which it had been confined. Now, Isadora Duncan uh, is, uh, more, more associated with the embodiment of nature, ancient Greece, the romantic and feminine, while Loe Fuller is more uh, associated with theatrical artifice, modern technology. Um, she's considered a modernist, she's androgynous and masculine. And both of these enterprising women left the United States for Europe, um, Loe Fuller in the same year that she had applied for um, copyright. Um, uh, this is also something I'd like to note in relation to copyright. While um, Isadora, scarce, uh, Isadora Duncan scarcely allowed herself to appear on film, Loie Fuller contem condemned her lack of access to copyright protection, uh, just as producers of copy cat dances uh, or, or copy da copycat dance films uh, would soon run amok with endless spin-offs of her subversive dance productions. Uh, Stasia Nyaprokoska, amid her early film performances from Capolani in 1908 to Dulac in 19, Dulac films in 1917, and after her 1930, or 1913 arrest in the United States uh, while touring um, as a dancer on a charge of indecency for lurid dress and provocative postures, vowed never to return to such a narrow-minded and barbaric country, so utterly impervious to any beautiful impression. Uh, so we see these dancers leaving and going to Paris. Um, similarly, Ida Rubinstein fled uh, dis disciplinarian Diaghilev's Ballet Russe to establish herself um, in France and Italy, um, like Neperkoska as an independent artist and impresario, breaking social roles and creating dance and film on her own terms. Uh, Jamil Anik, who is often referred to as a disciple of Isadora Duncan, uh, of her we, there's, we know very little, except uh, that she does appear in uh, a couple of Dulac's films, um, including uh, the 1920 film Malencontre, um, in Arabic basque postures. Um, there, I, I'm sorry, I don't have photos of that here, uh, but also in her 1927 uh, uh, film, in L'Imitation au Voyage, as a dancer on the stage in the background of, of the film. And so that's important because I want us to think about this move in Dulac's work from figurative to abstraction and, and her use of, uh, as we'll see, uh, Isadora Duncan and Loie Fuller as models for that abstraction as something that's uh, taking our gaze uh, and having us look both beyond the frame and in the depth of the frame um, and, and through this tension of surface and depth. So, uh, both, so, I, so symbolist theater um, is at the same time that uh, in fact, in the same year that Loe Fuller moves to France and uh, has filed her, her copyright case, um, we see the emergence of symbolist theater. And 
This is a portrait of, of Le Nipo by Edward uh, Vuillard, a Nabi painter, who we'll see is also uh, a decorator and, a, and uh, a, a very important influence on the French Impressionists. So the Simplest Theatre, for which Rajan was one of the main hosts um, at her Théâtre Rajan. Uh, she was a, a host for the mobile theatre company Théâtre de l'Oeuvre, created by uh, by Bouillard and La Nupot uh, in 1892, 93. Um, so the simplest theater with this emphasis on abstraction and sensation through a minimization of plot, decor and performance became a central site of influence for the suggestive stylistic practices of a socially progressive 1920s French art cinema. Here we have uh, Stasia Novrakoska. Sorry, I think I meant to show you those images earlier. Um, uh, and Don Leilada and this Arabesco posture. She's also Dulac's first lover. Um, and Ida Ruben, Rubenstein and Jamil Anik from her dances and not, uh, unfortunately, not from film. This is the, one of the images that she appears in, but we, she's in the background and not in this particular frame, unfortunately. Um, so, I'm sorry, I lost myself a little bit. Um, so, let me go back here. <laughs> here, okay, so in the, it is in this vibrant context of intermedial mobility, spontaneous or negotiated, ne negotiated intermediality, as Laurent Guido calls it, of symbolist scenography and performance, that social rights, such as modern gender roles and sexual liberty, also went head to head or toe to toe with legal rights, including limits on bodily display. So, um, Yes, yeah, so here we have uh, Empresario Rajan, um, yeah, for Koska arrested for indecency in New York, uh, Rubenstein, and uh, Jamil Anik. So it is also in this context that modern performance artists from theater, pantomime, and dance chasséed or sashayed the limits of sta the stage, venturing out as independent impresarios, working on their own terms, and embracing cinema at a its power as a liberating social tool. So, on, uh, so on the on the one hand, uh, the stars of the symbolist theater, Suzanne Dupré for Le Nieu Po, um, uh, Georgette Le Leblanc, uh, who worked with Maeterlinck, all of the symbolist theater, and Eve Francis. Uh, who worked with Claudel would become the muses of the 1920s Impressionist avant-garde, de Luc, du Lac, Lherbier, um, each Belle Epoque era theater critics. Um, just as the modern dancers from uh, Duncan and Fuller, uh, sorry, Duncan and Fuller to disciples, you know, Rukowska, Rubinstein, and Anique made an undeniable impact on the Paris scene, revolutionizing dance and cinematic expressivity as performers or as models of figuration and abstraction in Impressionist films. As Dulac notes in her 1927 essay from Sentiment uh, uh, to Line, from sen uh, Du Sentiment à la Ligne, or from Sentiment to Line, opening new possibilities for spectators to recreate themselves. And it's in, um, I'm sorry, I got a, a little muddled with my slides here, but um, it is in that essay that she first talks about uh, she, that an early draft of that essay where she describes um, the this model um, as based on uh, Isadora Duncan and Loie Fuller in an early draft. Um, and I will show you that what, uh, in a moment because it's a little further down. Uh, okay, so moving beyond established discourses of medium specificity, the entanglement of social rights and performance gestures in Belle Epoque Paris reveals not only a shared modernist impulse, but also a transnational story of intermedial mobility and mobile gesture by these artists of stage and screen. Like the symbolist gestures, sorry, uh, like the symbolist gestures and mise en scène of the pan European symbolist theater. Uh, the gendered choreographies of migrating dancers played a pivotal role in setting the stage for these suggestive and socially 
uh, progressive practices of the first French art cinema. The question is though, what are these gestures and what do they hide or reveal? Um, and a partial answer comes to this, comes to us through um, this influence of Nabi synthetism that is contemporaneous with Loewy Fuller. And um, uh, Nell Andrew has written a wonderful book um, explaining that connection between Na the Nabi uh, symbolists and Loewy Fuller. So, um, Lenya Poe's symbolist theater or Nabi synthetism, um, interestingly, in this uh, is, is drawing upon uh, these Nabi models. Uh, and in fact, uh, Dulac's decorator uh, was one of the, the uh, was an actor for Lenya Poe during this period as well. And Dulac went to uh, attended the Salon d'Automne, uh, where we are, and Matisse and many of these artists were present. She was very close to the host of the Salon um, d'Automne, Marcel Samba. So there are real material connections here. Um, but so looking at this for a model for um, abstraction in the same period that, um, that Loie Fuller uh, had headlined her dance at the Folie Berger um, as captured by Toulouse-Lautrec, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec as a symbol of modernism. And uh, we, we see that uh, the Nabis were inspired similarly by Louis Fuller as well as Gauguin uh, in their synthesis approach to line, form, and color. So, um, so we can. I, so I'm interested in the way in which the films of Duluc, Lerbier, and Dulac, Epstein as well, are using this 2D flatness um, and use of line and form of the synth of synthetism uh, in their films. So here are just a very quick examples from uh, from uh, from. Uh, we saw some from Deluxe El Dorado with A. Francis, but here's some of uh, L'Herbier's Le Numain. And where I'm just going to go through this very quickly, where the figure has used as either there's like either flattening um, or um, the figure is used as an abstract form. Uh, and in the in the work of Dulac, where the uh, where the figure is either as a line. We see that, uh, or there's a use of the circle. And this is an, uh, here's an image from theater from, uh, but we see the use of the circle also in Dulac's films. Um, and often that circle or the here in the, this case, we have um, the portal is used as this window into the imaginary or, or what is, um, or into the dream space, right? Um, of course, here uh, we also see the you know we see the matching, matching costume and background, also the use of artificial background. But then when she looks through the portal, her dreams are denied. Um, so Dulac returns to this kind of uh, this technique many times in, in her work. Um, I think we're at close to time. Um, oh shoot! Okay, so I'm going to get to my my conclusion here. So so circles we can see there's, and then she also uses the arabesque. Um, do I have five minutes? Um, maybe like two, three. Okay, all right. So here, um, I I just want to show you this uh, intermedial use of gesture. Um, I'll just show you this one clip and then uh, so you see the arabesque form here is very prominent on the dress and it's and and this these kinds of gestures are passed through the film to um, to make for example this woman who has been cheated on by the bell dame ends up using that as a way of of, of finding her own liberation so um, we we familiar we're all familiar with the gesture in smiling Madame bidet of the tennis man um, but we see it throughout her films um, particularly um, uh, well, in figurative forms, but also in more abstract forms in her film, Arabesque. So 
Um, here's the original text or the text that we see in the article. Um, I evoke a dancer, a woman, no, uh, a line bounding to harmonious rhythms, luminous projection, um, no fluid rhythms. Um, and, and so, and then just to go to the last line, uh, to better lines and surfaces evolving, stripped of meanings, all too human, to better elevate our, itself towards abstraction of sentiments, leaving more room for sensations and dreams. Um, the origins of this are in the quote of Isadora, are in Isadora Duncan and Louis Fuller, as you can see here, the origins in dance. Um, so to come to my, my conclusion again, so what, not only what are these models used for, what are they trying to say, um, but what are they hiding or what is being protected? So I just wanna briefly say that, so we, here's some images of Louis Fuller. Uh, and this is from the uh, copyright uh, deposit in 1892. Um, this legal case of Loewy Fuller versus uh, Minnie Renwood Bemis, which has been mentioned earlier yesterday on yesterday's panel. Um, in this panel, or in this uh, in this request, um, Fuller asked for an injunction of copyright for uh, copyright infringement of her serpentine dance and was denied, as has been noted. Uh, because dance was not considered a dramatic composition, it was non-narrative or without story. Um, the exact wording of the uh, refusal was that stage dance illustrating the poetry of motion by a series of graceful movements combined with an attractive arrangement of drapery, lights, and shadows, but, no, but telling no story, portraying no character, and depicting no emotion is not a dramatic composition within the meaning of the Copyright Act. Um, so as we know, Fuller left for uh, Paris in the same year, 1892, where she did gain widespread recognition. Um, and indeed, um, having taken this uh, conception of dramatic composition um, in which action is not narrated, narrated or described, but represented, Fuller herself argued that uh, like the Impressionists and Avant-Gardists later, that movement, gesture, and facial expression, which address the eye, are as much a part of the dramatic composition designed or suited for public representation as spoken language, which addresses the ear. Um, a phrase that Dulac herself kind of, uh, uses, cinema should do for the eye, what music does for the ear. But nonetheless, in 1894, um, so we see that, uh, so Louis Fuller was uh, able to obtain a patent for her costume construction or garment for dancers. Um, still, as we know, um, her many imitators through the Annabelle dances, Lily Fuller was not able to stop the reproduction or circulation of the serpentine dance. I'm less interested in the circulation and more in its discursive role. Again, what is it trying to say or what is being hidden? Um, it's through the work of Andrea, Andrea Kraut, her wonderful work on chore choreography and copyright um, that looks at multiple case studies, including Fuller and Bemis, um, that we um, can, uh, it, that draws us to look, or pushes us to look at the Kazakh, um, India's Kazakh dances and the Nauch dances, which are also uh, appropriated and used by Ruth Santini. Um, so to look at, so doing this, we find multiple precedents as well as multiple cases of appropriation. In fact, Ruth Santini built her career after seeing Louis Fuller and Isadora Duncan dance in Paris, and then began to research the Indian Nauch dance in 1906. Um, so, um, drawing on Kraut, um, by claiming copyright protection, Fuller is seeking not only to assert her rights as a queer female artist in a patriarchal culture, she's also exercising the power of privilege as a white woman, um, albeit a queer white woman, um, in her, uh, and her ownership over the postures of the Indian dancer. So again, what is hidden? Um, so, um, I just want to recall, you know, this, this, I just want us to, to draw us to, to look at these figures in the background, um, to, to think about who has the right to copyright, um, and, and what can we learn from this. Um, I do have more concluding notes. Um, on the case of Fuller versus Bemis, the insistence on dance to tell a story, um, as Kraut notes, um, it tells this tells us a lot about the relationship between race, gender, and property rights. Um, drawing on Cheryl Harris's groundbreaking 93 article, Whiteness as Property, whiteness has been legally constructed as a property interest. So, um, 
so kind of just point, maybe entering into the, our discussion, I'll conclude oh. here um, and say that the, these films, um, while inviting us um, to open up new spaces it, or to, to look beyond the frame, um, also invite us to open up spaces to reconstruct ourselves. They also open up spaces for new narratives and new histories. Um, so kind of echoing what Rafael de Luna uh, his question to uh, Abubakar this morning, um, beyond the contamination by the colonizer's gaze, how can we take these film representations and decolonize them? Um, how can we also use this tension between foreground and background, on screen and off screen, to look at what is pointed to beyond the frame, um, to offer alternative narratives and to expand what we call film history? Thank you. Thanks, thanks so much. Um, so if you can stop sharing so everyone can see us. Um, thanks for this really, really rich panel. And I think I'll start with Wyatt's question because it's here and we can all um, see it. Um, and so really just kind of thinking about the kind of background of the judges and like how copyright and kind of patent are kind of shaped in this period and what, what, what to kind of make, make of that background. So I don't know if you have thoughts about that, Jane. Um, Hunter might as well. Yeah, so his question is really tough. And when I, I did a book in 19, a very long time ago on uh, copyright, and it was a reaction to the um, apparatus theory that suggested that the only way to deal politically with a question of images moving and sound was uh, through, well, what, apparatus theory? And I thought it was much more political to think about property rights, privacy rights, and in doing this research, reading the court cases that were connected to the still photograph and also uh, motion pictures, it occurred to me that the legal scholars were um, trained in a particular way to use words to claim, but not to get any cultural distance, the kind that actually Hunter was getting on uh, Edison and the phenomenon of Edison. And this is, of course, Amy Comey Bryant, who we know is put on the Supreme Court to do a particular job because of her background. And what occurred to me in reading all of these decisions around 1991, well, before that actually, was how they were so unaware of their backgrounds. I don't know if the law schools today have students thinking about what do you bring but when you say opinion, uh, as in legal opinion, all I read in this early period, and I'd like to throw it to Hunter because he's been reading these cases too, is, um, how should you put it? They, they take stabs at fields, technologies that they have very little knowledge about. Now the patent attorneys might be somewhat different in that they have to be trained in a particular way, but these judges were basically reflecting cultural attitudes. So this question of how do you study them, I think we do it with critique and we talk about legal fiction mm -hmm. because that's how you train a lawyer to subscribe to legal fictions. But but Hunter, please add to this. Um, yeah, I don't know anything super specific about uh, the, the judges and how they were trained. But I mean, if you go through some of the court documents, especially with the Edison uh, biograph situation, some of this stuff is very like egregious and they're, they themselves are like working through what it is, you know, like in that Martin Saposi article, which I really like, and he goes through this in an interesting way. Uh, it's basically like Edison's patents are too broad. And, too broad. And, but the judges themselves are basically working kind of with the lawyers and saying, well, okay, let's compare these two cameras. Let's figure out what's what's different and what's similar. What's what in this patent will apply to to your inv invention. So th they themselves are like working through like what the like limits of these patents are. And they're kind of like helping Edison concoct his own uh, <laughs> strategy for how to revise it or how to litigate on it. Um, I think that's right. They're helping Edison. Yeah. And sometimes they just, they say they can't because it's way too broad. Terrific. Um, other questions either in the audience? Um, here's another one. Um, so Tammy, thanks 
for this fascinating presentation. It was great to find out about uh, Jamal Anak. Can you say more about her? Seeing her image immediately brought Josephine Baker to mind. Um, and you can right. link. Hit the unmute. <laughs> okay. Yes, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, Josephine Baker also went to Paris during this period. So, it, I mean, it is a, a, a space it's as as African-American jazz artists would later in the 50s. It's a space that allowed for um, a certain degree of liberation, of course, um, from certain laws and, and, uh, and also, um, so I don't, I don't know a lot about Jamil and Neek's um, background aside from what she says herself. What I do know mostly I've learned through um, the Cinémathèque Française uh, file on um, from the Comité de Recherche Historique, um, the CRH, uh, during the war. Uh, it was a meeting that took place in Dulac's apartment with Marianne Coulson, with her partner Marianne Coulson Marville um, after Dulac's death, and Musidora and other uh, women, uh, Marie Epstein. Um, who would come there and they would interview figures from the silent period. And one of the figures that they interviewed was Jamil Anik. And so that's how I found out a little bit more about her beyond what we see in these, uh, what we um, see in these films, which are very hard for me to get from the archive. <laughs> um, so it's why I'm lacking in images. Well, Malencontre is a lost film for one, um, but L'Invitation au Voyage, um, she does appear there. And, um, and I just didn't get a chance to, to take a frame from that, but I, aside from the one I had, but um, she does talk, she mostly talks about her in origin. Uh, I don't know if she's from Java or exactly where I have. Of course, um, there are some articles in um, the 1920s in the press where she's referred to as Javanese, but I wouldn't rely on that designation. Um, but she, um, she talks about her role in Dulac's films and her, her roles and also how kind Dulac was to her and you know how she directed her and um, and the photos, the images that we see. Um, she, I mean, she rein, reminds me of kind of a Sarah Jane character in Imitation of Life. Or she's, she has these grandiose gestures and even though she's the sister uh, and uh, the secondary character, she really has the screen presence in, in that it seems in that film from the kinds of, of gestures in the narrative. And, um, but of course I'm relying on still images and accounts of the film because the film is considered lost, uh, Malencontre. Um, but yeah, Josephine Baker um, and uh, her work, there's, there is a film from the twenties um, with uh, featuring Josephine Baker um, that I, I should look at more closely. Um, to be honest, the dance part of my work is just beginning. So I'm kind of, was, uh, it's all kind of new uh, work that I'm trying to do. I, my next article is on Isadora Duncan, uh, but, it, but who's someone who doesn't appear on film uh, at all, but for a few seconds. Um, and when she's not dancing, she refused to be filmed. So, um, and I think that also speaks to, you know, the, the lack of copyright in dance, because that was, you know, it was that case, 1892, that really set um, the precedent for dance to not be copyrighted in the United States until 1976. So, um, but I'm also interested in not only, you know, that, it, I'm interested in, in why it was not um, allowed to be copyrighted, the non-narrative aspects, but yeah, Jamil Anik is a figure I really want to do more research on. Uh, because she also appears in the films of Abel Gans um, during that period. Great. I think that might be it, unless someone wants to have the last word. Um, I'll leave it. <laughs> okay. Thanks again for this terrific panel. And um, I will see you in six minutes um, for the last.